Hi. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I come here from Europe, where we have had this conveyor belt that Jamie James talked about this morning running for the past 20 years. Um, I've attended public domain day celebrations for the past couple of years in various forms and sizes, but like this energy here is amazing, and I want to congratulate you that you're part of the club again here in the United States. It's um, an amazing celebration, and uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about something that uh, uh, we have done in the past. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the public domain wasn't on hold, wasn't stopped in Europe. Still, it's something that we felt the urge to defend uh, because it's under attack. It's not under attack just by term extension. It's also under attack by expansion of the scope of copyright. It's by an attack of uh, interests that push licensing over copyright exceptions. There's multiple forms, and uh, a couple of years um, ago, 10 years ago, a bunch of us got together and thought this needed a manifesto that can guide us in our fight. And um, so 10 years ago, um, we launched, or we wrote, and then nine years ago to this day, we launched a manifesto which is called the Public Domain Manifesto. And on the occasion of today, we're relaunching that. It's, um, it's made a little bit prettier and a little bit more um, 2019. Um, this is still um, my favorite sentence from the Public Domain Manifesto. It turns kind of like the normal thinking about copyright, about the public domain, about how we should interact with our culture on its head. It says the public domain is the rule and copyright protection is an exception, as is the exception. And as Larry pointed out so eloquently earlier today, it takes way too long, this exception. That's one of the things we're trying to address with the manifesto, uh, but by long, not the only one. Um, the Public Domain Manifesto, and this is uh, the website we're launching today, is, uh, or relaunching today, um, addresses a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, as important as the public domain is, there is surprisingly little definition of it around. Um, most of, um, when, when, when James this, uh, earlier today outlined the architecture of the public domain, he was mainly referring to copyright law. I'm not extremely familiar with the United States Copyright Code, but in Europe, the entire um, corpus of copyright law doesn't mention the term public domain once. Like, it is defined by its absence, and we thought we needed to have a manifesto that can guide us that doesn't define the public domain by the absence of rights, but defines us as something positive, as something um, which has value in itself, which, and I think the previous speaker just illustrated how extremely important the public domain is for many of us to enjoy uh, uh, works of culture and knowledge. And uh, in doing so, um, with the Public Domain Manifesto, um, we've chosen to uh, not only positively describe it, but we're also having a, a slightly expansive view of the public domain. Um, in the public domain, we're not only including the classical public domain, the things that um, fall out of copyright, like the works from 1923 now, or the things that never obtain copyright permission, but importantly also the stuff that's voluntary dedicated to the commons, and uh, even more importantly, I think, also in the light of the speaker uh, before, um, works that are available under exceptions and limitations to copyright, such as fair use. It can't be that people who are not able to consume uh, uh, copyrighted work the, the, the normal way are blocked from doing so by the law um, until 70 years after the death of an author. That should be pretty much immediately the case for, for obvious reasons, right? Um, so um, the, the public domain manifesto for us is something that was important in our work of setting down like the principles. Um, and it served as a guideline. So we've got like a couple of, 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 of relatively high-level principles in there that have guided um, a movement uh, over the years. And when we um, discovered halfway last year that actually that was almost the 10th anniversary this year um, of the Public Domain Manifesto, we went to reread this. And I mean, I've written or contributed to writing a lot of things 10 years ago that I think, yeah, maybe this 
doesn't deserve a relaunch in a new uh, website. This actually is good writing, like you can read it from top to bottom and there's nothing that I would replace at the moment. It's just a very solid document um, that owes a lot to the drafters and to the um, people involved in originally uh, creating that. And among the original signatures are Larry, are James, are Jennifer, are um, Rick Prelinger. So about half the previous speakers here have contributed to the manifesto. It's kind of like um, maybe the manifesto which brings together most of the people or, or, or this group. And um, what we've done now with this relaunch is one, we've uh, uh, made it multilingual. Over the years, like not only 3,200 signatures have accrued. At some point, like after we launched it, we stopped counting at 1,000. And then when we looked last year, again, it was suddenly 3,000. People still find that thing and sign it. And uh, if you haven't signed it, a lot of people here in the room probably have, you can still sign it. So go to the public domain manifesto and sign it. We have it available in 25 different translations. Like we haven't managed to get all of them up on the, on the website before. This was people like sending us translations in and we just put like PDF versions on the on the old website now it's fully integrated so it's multilingual you can send me translations if we don't have them yet and we can add them to the thing and um, as I mentioned you can sign them you will find like the the names of the people I've mentioned earlier um, on this slide so quickly um, I've mentioned and here's how you can sign it it's all fully automated now like before we actually had to like get emails and carry them to another server and upload them it's a little bit easier for us um, and what I, what I wanted to mention, like this is a guiding principle for us. And, and so it also serves as a instrument of looking back, like what has happened in the last 10 years? How has the public domain fared when measured against the manifesto? And this is by no means complete and to some kinds it's speculative because that European copyright reform process is dragging on and on and on. Um, but the first thing which I really hope um, that it somehow miraculously passes is, I mentioned earlier, one part of that inspiration was that the public domain wasn't mentioned in EU copyright law. We actually, in this dreadful EU copyright reform process, we have at least one light point, and that is that it, the current compromise text includes a definition of, or a reference to the public domain uh, in a small provision which tries to end this practice by museums to lock reproductions of public domain works away. If this copyright reform passes in its current, would pass in its current form, there are lots of dreadful things in there, but it would also, at least in Europe, um, bring a positive end to this practice of locking public domain stuff away um, by museums who are supposed to make that available to all of us and share that. Um, there's um, something we also spoke about, the need in the manifesto to make orphan uh, works and out-of-commerce works available. There's something in the EU copyright uh, uh, reform text at the moment that is going in that direction. Then, as, as Ben has just illustrated, like this open glam movement has really taken off in the years. In the public domain manifesto, we called on museums and other cultural heritage institutions to take a special role in safeguarding the public domain, and we've seen that from the Met Museum, from the Cleveland Museum, from the Rijksmuseum, from Europeana, um, all these institutions, we see more and more actually stepping up and taking this role. And I don't know if we can take credit for that, but somebody gave Larry and the movement he started, and that will be us, I guess, credit for no new term extension this year in the United States. So I think to some degree, like that's also a very positive development, right? There's bad stuff, like, um, and the same thing, like this NAFTA 2.0 uh, uh, thing is, uh, contains a extension of term of 20 years in Canada that's gonna help no one. Japan this year has introduced or has prolonged its copyright protection term from, 70 to, uh, from 50 to 70 years. Um, the EU-Mercosur trade agreement would force a number of southern American countries to increase the term of protection there. And we're also seeing this expansion of rights going on. Wherever there's a problem, the natural reaction of like the copyright industries is asking for more rights. Maybe the most concrete danger that we're having there at the moment is in the EU that would grant a completely new press publisher's rights at the request of the publishing industry, which is unproven and has tried a couple of times and has failed, but would yet again build more protection around our culture that it can't be accessed to us. 
So um, with this, let me thank you. This manifesto has worked pretty well for us. It's really nice to read it and please sign it if you haven't done. Thank you so much and um, over to the next speaker.